me. Let's pray. Father God, we're gonna uh, we're gonna flesh this out now. Uh, we're gonna talk about what is in this passage. We're gonna talk about fear. So I pray for your Holy Spirit to show us and help us understand what you would have us see in this passage about Jesus uh, and about ourselves and about how you, in the midst of all this chaos, uh, you can still give us peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, I want to talk to you about three different kinds of fears from this passage. And so we're going to talk about a natural reactive fear. That's the first thing, natural or reactive fear. We're going to talk about an unbelieving fear, which some would say is an ungodly fear. Uh, we actually see a distinction about godly fear versus ungodly fear in the Bible. So that's the second thing, an unbelieving or a godly fear. And then a believing fear. What does it look like to fear God, as we're told throughout Scripture, to fear God, uh, to have a believing fear of God, a respect for Him? So let, let's go through those things from our passage. First of all, in verse 37, we see that a, a great windstorm had arisen, had, had arose in the sea, and it was the the waves were so great they were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. That's verse 37. The disciples appropriately have a reactive fear. Naturally, they respond to these waves and the crashing and the waters and the wind. They respond with a reactive fear. Now, what I want you to see is that type of fear is not necessarily a bad thing. I think God actually gives us reactive fear to protect us, to keep us safe from natural disaster. And so just think of a, a few situations. Think of, um, for me as a father, the other day I saw my four-year-old on the trampoline and she was uh, uh, trying to do somersaults. She's actually not four. She's five now. Wow. Uh, she was trying to do somersaults. And at one point on the trampoline, she jumped to do a somersault and landed on top of her head. And my wife and I were watching and we, both of us were like, oh, you, Liza, don't do that. That's dangerous. See, what was going on in us was a reactive fear because we were trying to protect her and keep her safe. And so that's a good, that's a natural, good, even loving type of fear for others. But there's also a, a type of fear, a reactive fear that happens to us uh, when we're in those situations. You know, when we feel threatened, uh, when we feel in danger or even weak, there's a certain aspect of natural reactive fear that's good. It, it's good for us to be able to say, uh, and really that, that leads to that believing fear of God that leads us to be able to say, God, I'm, I'm scared. I'm weak. I don't know what's going on. I need your help. And so there is a good responsive reactive fear, and I think that's what first takes the disciples so I, I actually had a situation very kind of similar to them. My family and I were on a boat one time on a lake up up in uh, the upstate on Lake Kiwi. And before we knew it, a great storm, uh, clouds had rolled in over the mountains and started the waves and the wind started to pick up. So we parked at a dock at a gas station and went inside the building to wait it out. And we, even being inside the building, we were scared. We were down there watching the water toss around, the boat bob up and down. And it was scary. I couldn't imagine being actually on that boat at that time during that storm. And yet there's, that's where the disciples are. So that's the first thing. There's a natural reactive fear that's going on here, which again, I think is a good thing. It's kind of like a neutral fear. Paul Tripp actually had a similar study this past week talking about different types of fear. And he said, in light of things going on, it's okay to be afraid of the coronavirus, but don't give in to fear. You see, what he was saying is, uh, what we see uh, in the news is this this really is a devastating illness. It, it has a high mortality rate, rate. So to a certain extent, we should be afraid of it because we should, that should lead us to wash our hands, to be safe, to follow uh, the government's guidelines for a time. 
uh, because we have a reactive fear that's appropriate here in this situation. So that's the first thing from this passage. The second thing we see is uh, there, there's an unbelieving fear. So this natural reactive fear actually transitions. It moves into a more serious fear, which becomes actually unbelieving and ungodly. We see that in verse 38. It says, He was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? See, I want, I want to show you the progress of unbelief that goes on here. First, um, they, they go to Jesus. They wake him up, uh, probably in a hurry. And their first question is, don't you care? Do you not care about us at all? Do you not care that we're, we're perishing, we're dying? Do you care for our life, our safety, our health? And so what's the progress of unbelief going on here? It's, it's first they presume that they know Jesus' thoughts and feelings. They, they kind of presume and assume that they know exactly what Jesus is thinking and what they're feeling about him. Don't you even care about us? And then that presumption that assuming that they know what Jesus is thinking leads them to get kind of angry. We see the tone that they seem to be angry with Jesus, almost like a harsh tone towards Jesus. And then there's doubt. And the doubt comes up in that question, don't you care about us? Don't you care that we're perishing? You see, they actually are doubting Jesus' love and care. Even though he's shown them throughout his ministry that he cares for them, they doubt it. And then that doubt leads to them accusing Jesus, ultimately. They accuse him of not caring. They accuse him of wanting them dead. You know, don't you care that... We're perishing. Basically, do you want us to die? And so they're accusing him of not caring. They're accusing him of not loving and not wanting to preserve their life. And, and that happens to us. We can easily go from that first reactive kind of neutral fear to an ungodly fear that presumes that we know we know that God is, maybe he's punishing us for something we did. Maybe he doesn't like the way our relationship's been with him, so he's going to inflict us with some kind of sickness. You know, others might say of this coronavirus, well, God's finally, you know, wiping people out because they haven't served him. I, I don't, I think that's a very dangerous grounds to walk on, to presume that we know what God is up to in light of all this. I don't think we have a right to say that God is doing this very thing in our world today for a specific reason, because we don't know. That's a dangerous presumption to make. And so we have to be careful about presuming, because, because that can lead us to get angry with God, to get self-righteous, to think we don't deserve this, to doubt his love for us and his care and his control, and to then ultimately accuse him of things that, he might not actually be up to, and he might not be feeling, and he not, might not be thinking. So that's a, that's a dangerous, unbelieving fear. And we do this. I've done this when I've gotten sick, when I'm next to the toilet and I'm crying out, why, God, why would you do that? What did I do to deserve this? Where, where are you? Why aren't you coming to me? You see, what I'm asking in that situation is, obviously there's something I've done. Obviously, you're angry with me for some reason because I'm sitting here next to the toilet sick out of my mind. But that's a presumption, and that's an accuse, accusing God, really, for something I don't, I don't I don't have a place to really question and accuse. And so in, in those situations and in our situations, what do we do? I think we just acknowledge Jesus is in control. He loves us. And God has told us who he is. He's told us he's a merciful God, a gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, that he's patient, that he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. So I think we have to remind ourselves of that over and over. And then the third fear we see in this is Jesus, in verse 39, woke up. He rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? 
Have you still no faith? You see, he's saying there's, there's an unbelief there. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The last kind of fear that we see here is a believing fear. When we understand who Jesus is as creator and sustainer of all things, that he has the power in one word to change every situation, to, to flip it completely on its opposite end. You see, the way this storm was described early on is that it was a great windstorm. But then after Jesus said, peace be still, it says in verse 39 that there was a great calm. It's the complete opposite. And Jesus has the power to do that. Jesus has the power to stop the coronavirus right now. We don't, we don't know if he will. He could, but right now he's not. But he also has the power to, to completely change your heart and my heart. To be able to say to each one of us that if this storm does not calm down, he can calm the storm inside your heart. The, the storm of unbelief, the storm of doubt, the storm of presumption, the storm of accusing God. He can calm that storm and say to our own hearts, peace be still, because I have loved you. I have died for you. I've called you by name. You are mine. And in Isaiah, he says, you can pass through the waters and I will be with you. And the waves will not overcome you. And so this, this Jesus can calm our soul, can give peace to our soul by showing us first that we are sinners that we deserve the waves, we deserve the destruction, but Jesus came to take the destruction for us. He suffered on the cross for our sins. He cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he went through a time of suffering and no peace so that we could have peace with God. And this is what Romans 5.1 says. It says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what believing fear looks like. It's, it's like the disciples being able to say, Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? You see, Jesus actually said in Luke chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, He said, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more that they can do. But I will warn you to whom to fear. Fear him who has, after he has killed the body, has the authority to cast it into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. That is, fear God. Fear Jesus. Not in a scary, what's he going to do to me, but in a, I know exactly what he's capable of. But in his love and mercy, he bore that for me. He, he took on hell for me and for you if you believe so that we don't have to. And this Jesus, who is almighty, all powerful, all in control, can calm your storms. And that's good news. So I pray that as you continue to talk through these things as a family and uh, as a household, neighbors, friends, whoever you're there worshiping with ask yourselves these questions when do i get when do i get afraid naturally reactively when am i afraid when do i take that to the next level and begin to presume and accuse jesus but then how can i believe jesus how can i believe the gospel in this situation and in other situations so take those things and take the other questions that you have there in your worship guide and discuss those for a, for a few minutes with one another. Thanks.